All right, well, this evening, as I said, we're going to break ground on the letter of James. Um, so let me begin by reading just the first four verses, and this is as far as we're going to get this evening. So James, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be complete, or perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our uh, hearing this evening. Now, um, this morning we were considering what a treasure uh, God has given to us uh, in the Bible because we, as we, we saw this morning, it's in the Bible that he reveals to us his most important truth, and that is what he has done to reconcile us in Christ and how we can receive that reconciliation, how we can be forgiven, how we can be justified, how we can be adopted, how we can be sanctified, how we can be glorified. But uh, another very important benefit of Scripture is the view that it gives to us of what God is doing behind the scenes. Okay? The answers that it gives to life's most important questions, you know, not just the ones we usually think about, which is, you know, where have we come from? Well, of course, God made us, why we're here, to love and honor and give Him glory, and where we're going, which is to heaven, where we will enjoy Him forever, but also why we have to face the things that we do in this life, particularly why we have to go through difficulties, why we have to go through trials. Well, James tells us in a nutshell, it is that we might grow in grace, that we might grow in endurance, uh, and that that would create certain other benefits. But before we look at that topic in particular, I did want to give a brief introduction to the book itself. First of all, the book of James uh, has been called the New Testament book of Proverbs. And the reason being is that it focuses very much on the law of God. Now, the Old Testament book is very useful. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to be reading Proverbs. It's interesting that, that there was no collusion there, but um, it just, that's the book that came up after this decision to look into this book was made. But it's a very valuable book, Proverbs, because in it, Solomon takes the law of God which is God's perfect standard of how we are to live, how we are to love Him and our neighbor, and He applies it to everyday situations. You ever wonder how to apply the law? The book of Proverbs is all about that. That's what it means to teach wisdom to the naive. It's not enough to have knowledge, okay? We, we all know what the Ten Commandments teach, but how are they to be applied? You know, how do you apply these things? Some of it's quite obvious, but there are applications that perhaps we haven't thought of. And wisdom is the ability to take knowledge and skillfully apply it to any situation, and that is what Solomon does. You know, as a matter of fact, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about that that's exactly what Jesus did as well in his earthly life and ministry. His entire life was applying his father's law to every situation that he had to face and to do it out of love for him and to do it for his honor and his glory. You know, if you want to understand what the book of Proverbs says, just look at the life of Jesus Christ because he kept all of those commandments. He was essentially the living book of, of Proverbs. But again, getting back to James... That's also the character of his book, isn't it? Okay? If there is one thing that stands out very clearly in this letter, it's that James had a very high regard for the law. Now, that has, as a matter of fact, caused some difficulties in church history. Perhaps you'll recall Luther, who, uh, as he read the book, had a difficult time with it. As a matter of fact, on one occasion, he called it an epistle of straw. Now, thankfully, he changed his mind on that later, but there's a reason why he looked at it in that way. 
First of all, he found seemingly very little in it that pointed to faith in Christ and his redeeming work, okay? Instead, what he found was a great deal about works. Now, Jesus, let me just kind of you know, give you an overview of the book to, to kind of show you what he was looking at. Uh, for one thing, Jesus is only mentioned in two places. His, his name is only mentioned in two places. In the first verse that I just read, where James identifies himself, and notice how he identifies himself as a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he mentions Jesus, he doesn't necessarily mention him in his redeeming capacity, but rather he mentions him as his master, okay? I am the Lord's slave. I am his bondservant, okay? And then in the other place, in the first verse of chapter 2, he uses it to reprove his audience for breaking the law of love. He says, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. So again, not necessarily pointing to the redemptive work, or not necessarily not, but pointing rather to the fact that they're claiming to be those who have faith, and yet they're breaking the law of love by showing favoritism. And even when he mentions the word faith in the epistle, he doesn't directly mention justification by grace through faith alone. Now, he doesn't deny it, but he never explicitly talks about it. He talks about the other aspects of faith. In chapter 1, verse 3, that God tests faith. That's what we're looking at, as a matter of fact, tonight. That we need faith, secondly, to receive His promises in chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 5, verse 15. That we should live consistently with the faith that we profess with regard to the needs of the poor in chapter 2, verse 1. That God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith in chapter 2, verse 5. And then perhaps the most um, outstanding uh, application of faith is this, that genuine faith produces works. And he mentions that, I believe, a total of seven times. Now, he does use the word believe to refer to the false faith of the devils. And he uses the word believed to refer to how Abraham's works proved that he had genuine faith. He, he showed that he really did believe because he offered his son Isaac. And then grace is also mentioned once as that which God gives those who are humble. James does not emphasize salvation by grace through faith alone in the way that Paul does, but he doesn't deny it either. Rather, he presses the point that faith, the faith that saves, produces works. It changes the way we live. If we have saving faith, we will keep God's commandments. And what he's telling us here is simply this, that sanctification is as important as justification. I hope you all agree with me on that. Because without sanctification, there is no justification. So sanctification is extremely important. We cannot be justified without it. James appears almost to be dealing with, well, I think he is, dealing with a form of antinomianism. The idea that we can be saved and unchanged, that we can receive Christ as, as Savior and not receive Him as Lord, that we don't have to keep the law. But he says that is not the case. Faith without works is dead. Now, again, he's not saying that our works save us, and, and we're going to get into that, of course, as we move through the book but that saving faith changes the way we live. Now, Luther later understood that, and he revised his view of James and accepted it as being inspired of God. Okay, so that's what the book of James is all about. It, it has a, distinctively, a distinctive focus on the law of God and the importance of its application. Um, just use that book next time you run into somebody who's an antinomian who doesn't believe you need that, um, and James will set them right, hopefully. Okay, now secondly, we should ask the question, who is James? Now, 
there's a little bit of confusion on that because as I was looking through um, the Bible, I, I did run into um, two or three. And I say two or three because there is some question as to whether there are two or three that are mentioned. I, th I think there are three. But there's only three possibilities, okay? There's James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. There is James, the son of Alphaeus, who was another disciple, actually another apostle. And there is James, the half-brother of our Lord. Now, the first James, we know, was martyred early on. Remember how um, Herod had James, brother of John, put to death with the sword? And uh, when he saw how that pleased the people, that's when he arrested Peter. So James, that James, actually dies very early on. He was the first apostle to be martyred, the first one to be promoted to heaven. So he never actually became a very prominent leader in the church. With regard to the second James, okay, James the son of Alphaeus, uh, we really know very little about him. Uh, some believe that he is, he is the same James as the, um, the half-brother of, of Christ, believing that Alphaeus is Cleopas and that Cleopas is Joseph. And um, I'm not sure that I follow that reasoning, so I, I'd have to look through that a little bit more carefully. But that really does seem hard to prove. Um, the commentator in the Reformation Study Bible did not believe that to be the case. But the third James is the brother of our Lord, one who did become prominent in the early church and one who was known for his very high regard for the law of God. Now, it is interesting, James' story is, is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because he did not believe in Jesus at first. I mean, there's one occasion where he even taunted him, you know, go up to the feast. If you're the Messiah, go show yourself to everyone. Now, you know, put yourself in, in James' shoes. You know, you, you grew up with Jesus, okay? What would you think if, if a brother of yours started claiming that he was the Messiah? You know, I think it would probably be a kind of a hard pill to swallow. But eventually, he, he came to see that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Perhaps it was the miracles. Perhaps it was his, his resurrection. And I think that that may be the, the key because, you know, interestingly, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 4 through 7, the appearances of Christ. And Jesus actually made a special appearance to James, and that would be his half-brother James. I believe actually all his brothers came to believe in him. Yes, that is true. So he tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, okay, Paul says, He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So here, he's, he is talking about, and it's believed to be the, the James that we're referring to, the half-brother uh, of Christ. And although um, we don't often think about it, this James, as well as the other brothers, of Christ were actually in the upper room when they were praying and waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Luke writes in Acts chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, listen, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So at this point, all of Jesus' brothers were with him, and, and they believed. Okay, so James went from being this ultimate skeptic and one who was haranguing Jesus to one uh, who called himself, as we saw in verse 1, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not just my brother. <laughs> he is my master. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. And I am his slave. Now, this James became one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church. As we know, he was the leading spokesman at the Jerusalem council. 
And I want you, want you to think about this. This council is where the issue of the Judaizers was actually debated, okay? Remember the question that was being asked is, you know, especially with regard to the Gentiles, was faith in Christ alone enough to justify? Or did one, and particularly again the Gentiles, did they also need to be circumcised and observe the law of Moses? In other words, is it by grace through faith alone, or is it by faith alone? and by works, or by grace and works. Now James at the council clearly sided with justification by grace through faith alone. And this should tell us something of just his outlook in the letter that he wrote. Now church tradition also identifies him as the author, that is this particular James. And let me read to you just a quote that gives us some kind of interesting background on James that we don't find in the scriptures, that we don't find in his letter. But uh, this is what one commentator writes. <clears throat> the early church historian, Hegesippus, Heg Heg this, this is a difficult name, um, identified him as James the Just, testifying to his extraordinary godliness his zeal for obedience to the law of God, and his singular devotion to prayer. It was said that James, James's knees became so calloused from prayer that they resembled the knees of camels. Josephus records that James was martyred in AD 62. Eusebius said he was uh, beaten to death with a club after being thrown from the temple parapet. Hegesippus also records that he was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. Um, sounds like James didn't lead a very charmed life. So you, you've got um, James, this, this extraordinarily godly person who went through some very difficult trials. So he, he knows what trials are about, but even trials to end his life. By the way, just looking at the example of the apostles, should we expect the Christian life to be an easy life? You know, no, it, it isn't. Now, finally, for the introduction to whom, you know, did James write? Who is he writing to? Well, we read in verse 1, to the 12 tribes who were dispersed abroad. And that can mean one of two things. It could be referring to the Jews of the dispersion, okay? The, uh, the Jews who were scattered throughout the world during the time of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, uh, the Babylon, you know, Babylon, well, the Assyrians took and distributed the Jews everywhere. Um, and the Babylonian Empire displaced several of them as well. So he could have been writing to those who had, by this time, as we know, you know, as Paul goes out throughout the Roman Empire and he's evangelizing and we see there's Jews everywhere, those Jews do congregate three times a year in Jerusalem. And it could be that some of these Jews, the Jews that he was writing to, were some that were converted in Jerusalem at Pentecost and went back and started churches. And he could be addressing them, or he could be speaking symbolically of the New Testament church, which is called the Israel of God. And so it wouldn't be strange, he would use the, the terms the 12 tribes. Uh, it doesn't always refer to just the Jews, okay? Um, it can be referring to the church. But either way, he is writing to Christians, which means that whatever he writes here equally applies to us. Now let's move on from here to the first topic, and that is why God allows us to go through trials, why he allows us to go through difficulties. And I think one thing we should take into account here is that James was writing this letter during a time of revival. And I think that's kind of interesting. You know, the church was spreading. It was, people were being converted, you know, in, in various places all throughout the, uh, the empire. There is some question as to when James wrote this. It's believed that he wrote it before the Jerusalem Council, which means that perhaps only, um, you know, you, you do have the conversion of the Jews at Pentecost, and you have perhaps the first missionary journey that's taken place by this time, but it's still a time of revival. Again, the gospel being taken everywhere, people being converted, many people being saved. But notice that even though it was a time of revival, 
That didn't mean things were easy, okay? Revivals generally don't mean less trials. Revivals generally mean more trials. When God's kingdom pushes forward, the enemy's kingdom pushes back. I mean, have you ever found that to be true in just about anything that you do for the Lord? Whenever you renew your efforts to go forward in it, you find more resistance than you found before. Jonathan Edwards found this to be true during the Great Awakening. You know, there were many awakened, there were many converted, but there was so much opposition. So much opposition from the enemy, so, so many attempts to discredit the revival. Uh, so much so, I think it might have been Al Martin or uh, somebody who was speaking about revivals when you said, be careful what you pray for, because if you ask for revival and the Lord sends revival, things are just not going to become great and glorious. They're also going to become very difficult. By the way, we should still pray for revival because of the glorious part of it. You know, what happens to us is really, you know, secondary to God's glory, and he would have us pray for them. Now, the persecution in James' time was likely coming from the Jewish community. This was one of the reasons why the Judaizers existed, because they, um, they wanted not to be persecuted by the Jews. And as long as they were perceived as still holding to circumcision and to the law or the Mosaic traditions, they, they weren't really being persecuted by the Jews. It, it was when you rejected Moses... Uh, because of Christ. So, um, anyway, that, that's likely what was going on at this time. They were, um, the persecution was arising from the Jewish community. But that doesn't, I mean, what kind of a persecution it was, what kind of a trial it was, is really immaterial, uh, not for them, of course, but for us and, and our applications of this, because we want to really ask the question, why does God allow that? Why did God allow the Jews to persecute his church? You know, here, here's an interesting question. It's kind of like, why does God allow evil in the world? He could stop it, but he doesn't. Why does he allow persecution? He could prevent it, but he doesn't. Why? Well, he doesn't prevent evil because of the good he brings through it, right? And he doesn't prevent persecution or trial because also of the good that he brings through it. Now, I think that when we ask the question, why does God allow trials? I think the answer is really found in the word itself, because a trial, by definition, is a test. It's a test. God is testing us to see what we're made of, to show us where our commitments lie. It's not that he doesn't know, but we don't know. We don't truly know until our faith is tested. Now, these trials can come in many different forms, right? Generally, it's something that whatever it is, it's going to be something that's uncomfortable, something that's going to bring difficulty, something that's going to push us out of our comfort zone, okay? In the case of these early believers, it was primarily persecution. For us, it could be persecution. You know, if we stand up for Christ, if we stand out for Christ, we're going to be persecuted, or the Lord could use other things as well. And those things that he uses will most likely be in the areas of our greatest weaknesses and our greatest vulnerabilities. He's not going to necessarily test our strengths, though he might do that, but he will test our weaknesses, again, to show us our weaknesses. For some of us, that test may come in the area of our health. In others, it may be finances. In others, it may be relationships. For others, it may be temptations to particular sins to show us again where our weaknesses lie. But it could also be in more than one area. I mean, there's really, there's really no limit, though the Lord will not test us beyond what we're actually able to endure. But this is how he strengthens us by allowing us to be assaulted in our weaker areas. I mean, think about this. How does the person you know, who's been injured and who spent months in a hospital bed, how do they gain their strength back? Because you know, when you're laying um, down all the time, you, you become weak. So how does that person become strong again? 
Well, they don't become strong by moving them from a bed to a chair so they can just sit all day long in the chair. But they put them through rehab, right? And in rehab, they exercise them. Exercise is challenging the muscles to go beyond or actually to kind of go as far as they can go so that they become stronger. You know, same thing is true of just about anything. Just think about, you know, those trees. The trees that have the deepest and strongest and sturdiest roots are those that grow in those areas that have the most frequent storms, you know, that have to um, hold up under the wind. The wind stimulates the tree to put its roots down even further, okay? Well, the same thing happens with us, that it happens spiritually uh, in the same way that it happens physically. James writes in verse 3, the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this presents a different view of Christianity than perhaps we were initially introduced to when we came to Christ um, in the first place. Okay, we've all likely heard the expression, and maybe we even believed it at one time, just come to Christ and all your troubles will be over. You know, well, it is true that certain troubles are over. You know, no longer have to worry about hell. And I know that I have a heavenly father who loves me. I, I know I have a heavenly home. And those are wonderful things. But life does not get easier. I mean, it may for a while. There's that, you know, initial stage when you're, you're just born again and you're young. But it isn't very long before the trials begin. Uh, the troubles, you know, the Lord brings them into our lives and the reason he does is to help us to grow, okay, to produce endurance. Now, endurance, that's the same thing that, um, you know, again, in the rehab, just again, think about rehab. They're exercising the body so that it can have more and more endurance. Well, God exercises us so that we will have more and more endurance. We'll have that stick to ativity, if I can use that word. That's an old word, probably comes from a, an old Disney movie. But it's the idea of I'm not going to give up, but I'm going to continue to persevere. Now, endurance, James tells us, in turn produces additional virtues. He says in verse 4, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, it, it seems to imply, James seems to imply here that... Um, we can respond to these trials in a couple of different ways. You know, um, we can become angry or maybe bitter over these trials. Uh, and so we grow in resentfulness rather than in endurance and in what endurance should produce in our lives. Or we can agree with what the Lord is doing. We can see that it's coming from Him, realizing He is sovereign. And we can work with Him, uh, as it were, learn the lessons He wants to teach us uh, and the lesson is meant to perfect us, to help us to mature, to help us grow up, to complete us, he says, which means to make us whole or sound in the faith so that ultimately we will lack nothing. We will have everything we need. We'll have that enduring faith, a mature faith that will bring us to the end of the race. Now, remember, unbelievers are exempt. They seem to be exempt from trial. I mean, they are exempt from trials, uh, but not believers. Okay? Unbelievers, they may have an easy life, but then they get judgment. Again, remember Psalm 73. But every believer will go through trials. That's what Psalm 73 is all about. The psalmist was going through these heavy trials, but not the unbelievers, not the wicked, you know, just... Why am I going through all this difficulty if I'm doing the right thing? Well, it's because that's the way it is. Now, James will, in this letter, later speak about Abraham, how he was put under a very heavy trial. He was commanded to offer up his only son, Isaac. And James will tell us that he persevered under that trial, even to the point of raising his knife, fully intending to carry out what God commanded, knowing that if he went through with it, God would raise him from the dead, 
And he will tell us that how this willingness on Abraham's part showed that his faith had come to its completion, to its maturity, to its perfection. He will say in chapter 2, verse 22, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And what he means by that is the end for which God gave him faith in the first place was reached. And why does God give us faith? Well, we might think in terms of Paul, so we can trust in Christ and be justified. But he's thinking of another use of faith, and that is that we would trust the Lord for all the other things that we need as well. You know, Abraham trusted God, and he showed that he really did trust him when he was willing to kill his son. God brings trials into our lives so that we will learn to trust him, so that our love for him will reach that level, because that's really what is the difference between little trust and a lot of trust, is how much we love him. If we love him more, we will trust him more. And so, how should we look at trials? You know, none of us enjoy trials, do we? Well, James tells us to consider it all joy. Now, we may not be able to rejoice in the trial itself. I mean, the sickness, the financial hardship, the alienation from loved ones, the, the temptations to sin, maybe even the falling into sin. We do not enjoy those things as Christians. But we can rejoice in what these trials actually bring, which is endurance, maturity, completeness, so that we will lack in nothing but make it to the end. What we have to see is that God intends these trials for our good. And so we need to see that from that perspective, they are good. Remember how Paul says in, in 1 Thessalonians, I think it is, you know, uh, give thanks in all things. Well, wait a minute. You know, there's a lot of things that happen that I'm not necessarily thankful for. Well, we may not necessarily be thankful for those things in and of themselves, but we can be thankful for what the Lord is actually going to work through them because He is sovereign. He has said He will work all things together for good. We just simply need to believe that and know that that is why it has come. So let's, again, be encouraged through this to trust the Lord, to, to, to know what He's doing. He knows what He's doing in our difficulties and um, rejoice. All right, well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's ask the Lord to, to help us.